Welcome to the Healthy Heart Show, where we pull back the curtain on conventional medicine and dive into the root causes of cardiovascular health. If you are concerned about high cholesterol, high blood pressure, heart attacks, stroke, or atrial fibrillation, this is the place for you. We will provide natural heart information that will help you prevent, treat, and reverse any ailment, leaving pills and procedures out of the picture. Here are your guides to holistic heart health, board-certified cardiologist and Amazon best-selling author, Dr. Jack Wolfson, and natural heart doctor, naturopathic physician, Dr. Lauren Latanza. Welcome to today's episode of the Healthy Heart Show. We have an excellent guest for you today who is just an all-around fantastic person. I've been really looking forward to having her join us so she can share some of her vast knowledge that she has to offer to all of us. You know, we're always looking for the facts outside of mainstream medicine to expand your health span. We help keep you young and get you to your 100-year heart. Today, we bring you Dr. Tina Moore with nearly three decades experience in the medical world. Dr. Tina NDDC is a leading expert in holistic regenerative medicine and resilient health. Traditionally and alternatively trained in science and medicine as both a naturopathic physician and a chiropractor, she brings a truly unique perspective to those wishing to build a more robust foundation in their health and well-being. She is also an author, podcast host, speaker, kettlebell devotee, mother, and animal lover. Dr. Tina not only trains and coaches other doctors in their regenerative orthopedic therapies, which she has specialized in for over a decade in clinical practice, but she is a fierce advocate for health autonomy and personal responsibility, which she helps others improve through her many offerings at drtina.com. And I highly suggest giving her a follow on social media at Dr. Tina, that's T-Y-N-A. Um, she dives deep into the research and shares the data in an understandable and applicable way to help us all become more vital and more resilient. Welcome to the show, Dr. Tina. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I am delighted to be here and I'm so excited to just get to hang out with you today. Absolutely. I know. I was so looking forward to having you here. And we, I mean, we could take this show in any number of directions, but I think we've got it narrowed down to some really, really beneficial topics um, that I look forward to diving in with you. So um, let's just get started. So um, one topic that you and I have discussed um, in person, and I just lo really love your approach to this, is how muscle and muscle tone can really be assessed and determining a person's health and longevity? Oh, that's a good question. I, I firmly think of muscle mass as a vital sign. And I think it's an under um, appreciated, well, significantly, almost completely ignored vital sign that most doctors don't take into consideration when assessing a patient's overall vitality and ability to heal. And you know, as an naturopathic doctor, as well as I know that vitality is the key to somebody being able to turn that ship around and really get down the healing path. And so muscle, I think is a non-negotiable. Um, it's difficult to assess muscle tone if you don't know what you're looking for. And so I'm kind of a gym rat. So I hang out with well-muscled people. So I know it when I see it. I also know inflammation when I see it as do you. So that's, it's a more difficult thing to um, extrapolate to the general audience, but there are ways to check for it. We, I think we erroneously double down on fat mass as the big problem. And I think if we started to focus on strength and muscle building, the fat mass part would generally take care of itself for the most part. Um, so we have, you know, ways to assess fat mass, but I think that getting to the heart of the matter and figuring out is somebody well-muscled, well-toned, do they have well-trained skeletal muscles? So that comes through our history of asking questions. We can do a DEXA scan. That's a relatively inexpensive, uh, non-invasive way to check, but that's involves x-rays, which are, you know, not, I, I don't ideally want to x-ray my patients all the time. Right. So I actually make it real simple in my practice. If somebody isn't lifting weights two to three times a week consistently, they're not, they don't have good muscle mass. That's it. <laughs> if they're, if they're like a, like my husband is a blue collar guy, he works for a living, like physically does labor. Mm -hmm. Um, but that can go a variety of ways. You know, you could be on the job site and be doing nothing physical, or you could be on the job site and be like him and doing a lot of physical things. And so he keeps a decent amount of muscle mass, but he still consistently lifts, or I encourage him to anyway. Right. So really it comes down to that. Are you committing 
to gaining strength two to three times a week at the minimum. Um, and that's really all you need about three times a week. And if you're not, then I would put you on the frail category or heading towards frailty. Okay. Um, and so you say weightlifting. So what is your opinion on just like increasing muscular demand? So it'd be that, you know, hiking, like walking up a hill or body weight exercises. Is there a significant improvement with actually lifting weights? I think so. I think the actual act of resistance, because while hiking's awesome, that's up for debate. Some people hike down a flat trail here in Portland, or they hike up a hill or a mountain, like where you live in Arizona. So that's <laughs> a totally different beast. I think that the actual weight resistance is key and people want to start with their body weight. I think wherever you can start is where you start. So it, this is not, when I say lift heavy, people automatically assume I'm talking CrossFit. I am not talking CrossFit. I am not talking high metabolic demand kind of strength training. I'm talking slow and low, picking up a heavy thing and putting it down with strategy. So a push move, a pull move, a hinge move, a squat move, something unilateral to challenge strength and balance at the same time, done. Love it. I mean, that's it. Really simple, really basic. Cause in my head, I am a chiropractor as well as an naturopathic doctor. And I think biomechanically and biomechanically, we're really just a hinge system. We're upright mammals that are built in on a series of hinges. We were literally designed to pick heavy stuff up. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> and to ambulate that's, that's the advantage of being upright for yeah. us. And so I think that learning how to create tension and utilize that hinge system is what I'm talking about. Out, if right. that makes sense. Absolutely. So how, um, would you say is a safe, so maybe somebody's like into their thirties, forties and, you know, into their life and they've never really lifted. What is a good place to start? Yeah, that's a great question. In my practice, I specialized in regenerative injection therapy. So I was treating people who were injured or dealing with acute or chronic pain. And I have seen firsthand people listen to me. Like I posted something on Instagram the other day of like my typical workout and, of course, there was a bunch of people saying, I'm going to go try that. And I was slinging big kettlebells above my head in some pretty technical moves that took me years and years and years to learn the skill set to do yeah. safely. And people are like, what's that called? I'm going to go do it. And I'm like, no, <laughs> hard. No, that is an awesome way to blow your discs out, destroy your shoulders, like just a myriad of issues that are waiting for you if you don't get some kind of direction. And so I am a super big fan of investing in a strength and conditioning coach, not just, I mean, you can find great trainers anywhere, but just like in any profession, you know, it's a dime a dozen of what, what their certification is. It's unfortunate that the public has to sort of try to navigate that, but I am a big fan of finding somebody who knows what they're doing, strength and conditioning coach who is familiar with training people in your age bracket. That's the key. Mm -hmm. My coaches know how to train boomers and they know how to train people my age. I'm in my late forties. It really matters because anyone can train a 25 year old, but to strategically train somebody my age and then remind me, cause I'm a type a, I like to chase numbers on the barbell. I want to get lift heavier and heavier. I end up hurting myself and they keep me in check by reminding me that we want to be doing this into our eighties. Like the whole point of this is yeah. to live well into our eighties so that if I want to go climb the great wall of China with ease, I can do that at whatever age I choose to. Right. And so, and to not fall and break a hip, which is the kiss of death and which is the fate of so many Americans and so many people who don't strength. I really think like you've got one foot in the grave if you're not building muscle consistently because your body is generally speaking, in most cases, I would say 99% of the time, by the time you pass age 30, your body is breaking down your muscle actively and marbling it with fat, especially if you are kind of the standard American with that low grade metabolic syndrome simmering at all times. And so getting started is strategic. So hire somebody, if you can find group, uh, if you can't afford one-on-one -on -one, because you want eyeballs on you, making sure you're doing it right. You're learning a skill set. You want to learn it correctly. If you learn it incorrectly and you're self-taught, you really could, you're, you're, you're basically just drilling in bad habits. Right. Right. And that leads to joint degeneration. You can't keep putting a joint through range of motion incorrectly without hurting it eventually. Okay. For so it. That's key. If they are not keen on hiring a coach or that's out of their price bracket, I encourage them to find some kind of group coaching where it's small, maybe five or six people. So they still have eyeballs on them, but they're still getting some kind of one-on-one -on -one or some kind of direction that's more safe. If that's out of 
uh, if that's off the docket, because we li- some of us live in tyrannical states that are locked down and they close gyms on us. There's online opportunities. There's a million ways. And if you literally don't have the money or the means, or you don't know where to start, buy a pair of bands and buy and follow some of these booty classes, like literally just growing your glutes is the fastest way, in my opinion, out of And I don't have, this is my hypothesis. I don't have the strong literature to back this up, but I have seen this clinically as I'm sure you have a strong set of glutes and a strong set of legs, lower body really, really helps improve vitality, blood sugar regulation, decrease inflammation. Those are the big muscle groups. So I, I say, go after the big muscle group. So even if you're just doing some booty bands and following an influencer, doing some booty exercises and doing some squats and some deadlifts safely with bands, you're way ahead of the pack. Right. And it's working those major muscle groups that you get the most metabolic impact, right? Cause you yeah. keep that, you, you kind of start that fire and it kind of keeps it stoked for longer with these larger muscles. Yeah, absolutely. As opposed I- to like doing a bicep curl is going to only, yeah. Yeah. I could care less about my arms. I mean, I keep my arms healthy and my shoulders healthy so that I can be healthy and and not injure them. You know, the, the worst thing I ever see is when I'm on a plane. I mean, I am the woman who fixes people's shoulders after they've blown them out. Right. And I get on a plane and I'm sitting there and I usually try to get on early and I'm sitting there watching these frail deconditioned women, usually my age, trying to hoist some big suitcase (laughs) overhead. And I'm like, Oh my God, lady, what you're doing to your shoulder right now is because they're deconditioned. They have no right doing that. Well, you can tell that they haven't lifted anything heavy over their head in a number of years. I don't think anybody should be lifting anything overhead in an airplane to be totally honest with you, but (laughs) because it's a repetitive injury. So I end up getting, um, airline, uh, attendants in my clinic oh, yeah. to, to get their shoulders fixed after years of helping people oh, yeah. who, you know, so it's a, it's, it's just a, it's a being fragile and weak is not only a really good way to get hurt, but it's a great way to put a load on the system at large. Mm-hmm. And if you want to get down to it, and I know this is a little off topic, but this is what, in my opinion, as a naturopathic physician looking for root cause, this is what starts it. It right. starts with an injury that leads to them stopping moving and stopping exercising. And then the whole sequelae starts, right? If they're middle age, they start to get the middle age middle. They start to add that visceral fat. They usually are drinking alcohol to try to numb the pain and boom, we're walking headlong into metabolic syndrome. And then they're on the beta blockers and the blood pressure medications. And then they're on the anti-diabetic medications. And if you really, really dig back in the taking your history, which I'm sure you've done, you find out like, Oh, I hurt my shoulder when I was whatever. And that was sort of the beginning of the end of everything. Yeah. And then it's this snowball effect for prolonged inflammation. So it's just an acute trigger And then you, oh, you just think you're resting it or whatever, but then you really do snowball effect into this massive amount of inflammation downstream. Yeah. Um, So I think that talking about muscle and, you know, assessing, assessing that is a good way to segue into mitochondrial health. Um, So I think the conversation has transitioned from adrenal fatigue to mitochondrial health. And I think that that's, I think it's really valid. So I wanted to gain your opinions on that. Yeah, absolutely. Years ago, I don't know, probably almost 10 years ago, I was sitting in a conference and Dr. Schallenberger, who's the big prolo zone, he's the ozone guy, (laughs) really healthy elder gentleman, doctor who's been in practice forever. He said, how do you know if a patient has adrenal fatigue? And he said, because they're in your office. And then he said, how do you know if a patient has mitochondrial uh, fatigue or disruption? And he said, because they're in your office with adrenal fatigue. (laughs) I was like, yeah, pretty much. So um, mitochondria, there's a lot of talk about mitochondrial regenesis and fasting, right? That's always the, the big, the big conversation. If we fast, if we do certain things, we can regenerate our mitochondria, which are the little powerhouses of our cells. I wrote a paper about mitochondria in undergrad, by the way, because I was blown away that they were bacterium and that they were symbiotic in our cells. And I wrote a paper about it. (laughs) It's on a floppy disk somewhere. Maybe it's gone. So I have no idea. Oh, we can get anything off of a floppy disk anymore. I'm not really sure, but (laughs) I know I was, I was, I was prefacing my, and then I wrote a paper in AP calculus in high school about the use of the activator on vectors in chiropractic. So I was like, I was foreshadowing my future. I guess I knew mitochondria was going to be a big deal someday. So 
yeah, that's all great and good, but how do we add more mitochondria? How do we actually create more? And the only organ system that we can actively build is our muscle mass. Mm -hmm. And it is, you know, and this is a long conversation we don't have to get into right now, but it is an organ system and it has functions that are critical to immune health and to hormonal health and to inflammation and to all kinds of things, mitigating inflammation. And it's such a crucial organ system. Like for instance, interleukin six, that is created out of your fat cells is pro-inflammatory as a cytokine and interleukin six that's secreted out of healthy, well-trained skeletal muscle is a myokine, which is anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. But if you start going into sarcopenia and wasting and frailty, that interleukin six turns pro-inflammatory. So we, I mean, like it's literally a, a, an organ that we can control mm -hmm. and there's just no other organs in our body that we can do that with, right. that we can actively control its function. And so that is yet another reason why I say strength training is a non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to strength train, you're literally saying that you're just walking into a life of frailty, sickness, immune dysfunction, and ultimately probably a fractured hip, which is yeah. definitely the kiss of death. That is, yeah. you're either going to die soon after of a terrible pneumonia, or you're going to die in the next 10 years. Yeah. I mean, that's the statistics. So generally, um, so we want to make sure that we're, and, and you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot for your mitochondria. So if you build muscle, you build more mitochondria. That's it. Right. And you help the mitochondria, you have work better and oxidize better and do its thing. So I'm just such a super fan of the idea that this is something that I have some control over and it doesn't control me. I can, I get to have a say in how it functions. Right. And so that's why I say like, this is kind of a no brainer for anybody. And it doesn't mean getting like big, like the Hulk. Yeah. Uh, if we were to take every elderly patient in a, in a, an old folks home, or any kind of assisted living, and we were to put them through three days a week of regular strength training, I think we would see rates of dementia, rates of death, rates of chronic disease. I mean, shoot, if we did this for the whole general public, can you imagine the pandemic would have ended? We wouldn't have had one. Right. If everybody <laughs> had been thinking about this. Yeah, it's crazy. So I just think that it's, it's something that is sorely being missed and not talked about. People want to take all the supplements and do all the fasting and do all the things to regenerate their mitochondria. But I'm like, also you should be lifting weights. Right. So then do you think that if in increasing your mitochondria and your skeletal muscle, because in your body, the richest deposits of mitochondria are in your heart and in your brain. So do you think that that directly plays an impact in the function of your brain and in your heart, even though you're not directly increasing those numbers of mitochondria, but just in your body wide, you might just feel a little bit better overall? Well, I think you are directly impacting them in a roundabout way, because as you're lifting, you are putting yourself through cardiovascular work for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I was doing some really slow calculated lifts yesterday and like I was doing the eccentric really slow mm -hmm. and man, I was sweating. I was huffing. I was on the floor, like in a sweat angel, just dumping sweat because the amount of tension I had to create for an hour with my coach was so intense that I was like, I had to lay down after I was so wiped out. I wasn't doing anything like by to the, you know, to the observer, there was nothing cardiovascular going on, but it was a load and my heart was boom, boom, pumping. So that is beneficial. But I also think that we've got brain drived neurotrophic factor, BDNF being created and pumped through us when we exercise, any kind of exercise will really get you BDNF. And so it's a win-win, right? Like we're, I, and you know this, cause you lift being strong. And I, I could give you probably six different mechanisms, but being strong elicits a brain power that is unmatched. It's a superpower. And people who don't have it have no idea what I'm talking about, <laughs> <laughs> but it is such a sixth sense that I will not do business with somebody who doesn't strength train. Right. I mean, straight up, I will not do business with somebody in my entrepreneurial life. I will not entrust my health. I will not do, I will not commit to a path with someone who doesn't strength train. Cause I know they're missing a certain like vital sense. Yeah. Um, well, and talk about like a new, like a nootropic supplement. You can create one on your own because nootropics are pretty dang expensive and supplement land. Yeah. They're really kind of a top tier price point. So if you can create one on your own, and in terms of like working with somebody, I can't in good conscience come to work and not have worked out before getting here, because I know that my cognitive ability and my sharpness and everything that I have to offer to this patient or a podcast or whatever it might be that day 
is just ultimately diminished. Mm -hmm. It's true. And there's a calmness of temper and that comes with it, which I think we could use right now. There's it, it, it brings a level of patience and calm. I, it's funny that these meathead guys get these bad reputations. And I, I would say if you take like the typical bodybuilder from the nineties, who's roided out on synthetic testosterone, maybe, maybe, okay. That, that could be true, but everyone I know who's strong, who's committed to the path of strength are the calmest, most logical, sensible, kind, compassionate people. I mean, I joke with my coach. I'm like, if the zombie apocalypse happens, I am coming to this gym because this entire gym, I mean, their entire gym is full of very successful, calm, middle-aged people. And I'm like, bring it fit, very fit, strong. How often do you hear that? (laughs) Oh, he's like a big teddy bear. Yeah. He's this meatball, but (laughs) (laughs) right. So I think there's, you know, where I'm talking strength and conditioning, a little bit of body composition, bodybuilding stuff, because I like to have a nice booty and hips, Mm -hmm. but also really it's about strength. It's, it's not just about bodybuilding. And these are, these are calm people for a reason, because there is a definite neotropic impact happening that is pretty unmatched. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not all about just being aesthetically pleasing. It's really about expanding your health span, feeling more vital, being more cognitively aware, decreasing risks of so many things. So ultimately yeah. so incredibly important. Yeah. Plus it, I think it brings a sense of calm strength to the individual. And as a woman, particularly, this is critical, especially right now in this world that we live in having the knowledge that I, well, first off walking in the room as a strong fit individual, even though I'm pretty lean, I'm not real big. uh, I'm not intimidating by any means physically. The amount of respect it commands is unmatched. I didn't have it before when I was just skinny and frail. I did not have what I have now. Now, when I walk into a room full of MDs or I'm in a big conference, people automatically garner me respect. Maybe it's because I'm a little older, but even when I had long, dark hair and I didn't, you know, I didn't have my, my gray hairs, I wasn't really showing my age as much. Just being strong in stature, it, it changes the whole game. It changes how people treat me when I walk in a room anywhere. And then that piece, it all translates into mental strength. And I just, I know I can endure difficult things because I do it three times a week. I I endure something challenging. It doesn't hurt me to work out. I don't, I love working out. I don't, people are like, I hate going to the gym. I love it. It's my time alone, but it gives me this opportunity to challenge myself in a way I wouldn't have. And then I'm like, heck yeah, I can do anything. And I I won't make a big decision until I lift heavy on my lower body. Like if I have a big decision, my commitment to myself is I will go deadlift or squat and then I'll sleep on it. And then I get to make a decision in the morning. I was going to say, some people say sleep on it. You say squat, (laughs) squat and sleep. And then see how you feel. You know, I don't get to lash out at people. I don't get to have a reaction that is strong until I've at least worked it out of my body and then worked it out in my sleep. Right. Absolutely. Um, And so there's this whole kind of idea about being, you know, skinny fat and all of these kind of, like you mentioned, body composition. So um, how is it that obesity and frailty are actually kind of interlinked and both kind of linked to mortality? Yeah. Most people don't realize that they think frail and they think skinny little old person Mm -hmm. um, who's at the end of their days. And that is incorrect. There is, of course, some level of muscle mass in a person who's carrying around a lot of adipose tissue because they have to carry it around and fight gravity. So they do tend to have more muscle mass than someone who is is not carrying around a lot of excess um, adipose tissue, adipose tissue being fat cells, but the it's a chicken and egg. So as the adipose layers up, it tends to be pro-inflammatory, especially as time goes on. So I, the health at every size movement says, no, it doesn't impact your health. Well, maybe when you're 25 and you know this, you look at labs and it's like their homeostasis is hanging on pretty good because they're young, but give it 10 years and it's going to be a hot mess literally. And so I try to explain to patients, like it's literally like wearing around a blanket of inflammation plus a layer of even more inflammatory fat that's usually situated underneath the muscle belly uh, in the belly area and that visceral fat, which is like, you know, I mean, that's like, you want, Hey, you want a heart attack, grow some visceral fat, right? So bad. So that's the vicious cycle of this pro-inflammatory organ system, which is adipose. It's very pro-inflammatory. It completely 
dumps out your immune system and your immune response to anything to the point where I wouldn't inject people who were over a certain uh, body fat composition because it can definitely lead to infections, increased risk of infections. They wouldn't respond to the therapy. It just wasn't ethically sound. Um, and that chronic inflammation starts to ignite this sarcopenia or this muscle wasting phenomenon. And so we get in this vicious cycle and then the fat starts marbling into the muscle because if they're not using the muscle, it gets marbled literally like prime rib. And so if you look at a cross section of someone's leg, it's like you have, you have the female patient. I was this patient. I was like, when I was 38, I fit in the same jeans I fit in, in junior high. And I was so proud of myself, but I was just a bag of bones and fat. There was no muscle. And I felt like if I got hit by a car or I fell over, even I was going to shatter into a million pieces. Now I feel like I'm going to bounce. <laughs> I do. I feel like I have a pretty good chance of bouncing. So, <laughs> um, so there's this kind of, it, one drives the other, right? And so then as that sarcopenia and that frailty and that muscle wasting starts to get induced, now we've got this metabolic syndrome picture happening and now one begets the other. And it's very difficult to get out of so much so that when you start seeing people with a lot of visceral fat, a lot of diabetes or pre-diabetes and you know, a lot of that trunk obesity, that apple shape, you start to see wasting in the arms and legs. That's a direct result of their blood sugar dysregulation, as you know, and that chronic inflammation that's brewing constantly inside of them. And so for them to get out of that is even harder. It's a yeah. real challenge to get up and over that hump to the point where you start putting muscle mass on the arms and legs again. So when you, as a patient, uh, my, kind of my big signal is when my butt starts to get to shrink, when my butt starts shrinking and my legs start getting skinny, I'm like, uh Oh, something's wrong. And it usually coincides with me getting a thicker midsection. Yep. And that is a signal to me that I'm my blood sugar regulation is getting off and I need to dial it back in pretty quickly. The healthy heart show will be right back after we take this quick break to hear from our sponsor. Would you like to drink great tasting coffee? That's also good for your heart health. Cardiology coffee is your answer. This five-star rated coffee is delicious. It's a gourmet coffee that begins with whole organic beans, hand-selected, and carefully roasted. It's tested and certified to be free of pesticides, mold, and other toxins. Cardiology coffee is great for your heart, and you're going to love how it tastes. Order now online at cardiologycoffee.com. Now back to the Healthy Heart Show. Yeah, and I mean, really, we're just kind of circumventing the conversation of metabolic syndrome, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Uncle ob obesity, increased triglycerides, decreased HDL. So all of these things that are independent risk factors for mortality overall. And so of course, it, and now the talk of obesity really is kind of in the forefront, which is great so that people are working away from this. Um, and it can be scary. Like you said, you, you maybe started lifting weights later in life. And so it can be a scary thing because it's like, oh my, God, I hate going to the gym. I don't want to be this person. I don't want to start lifting weights, but putting some stress on your body actually will ultimately make you more resilient. Yes. So that that's, I think just like a really important thing that people need to realize. So you got to start somewhere, start where you're at. You don't have to, you know, swing kettlebells over your head on day one. And I would highly say, no. <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> that was like seven years in the making. Yeah, right. <laughs> it was scary. <laughs> even, yeah, even your day one was scary. You're we like, yeah. okay, I've trained seven years for this. <laughs> yeah. She was like, you're going to do this now. I'm like, what? Are you sure? I can, are you sure that's okay? No. Yeah. We just pick it up and put it down and hopefully with some strategy. And so that's where I think a good coach comes in. I, I, to be totally honest with you, when patients would come in to get injected by me with a shoulder issue or a hip issue or a knee issue, nine times out of 10, it was because they were deconditioned mm -hmm. and that joint was deconditioned. I could inject it all day. Sure. I would make the pain go away for a hot second. Sure. I would help to induce healing in the labrum or whatever soft tissues were injured, but it wasn't going to hold if there wasn't muscle mass around it. So I would tell him, I was like, you know, the several thousand you were about to spend on me, why don't you go spend it on a strength and conditioning coach and get strong and come back, or we'll do something in the interim to make your pain go away, but it's not going to hold unless you get that shoulder strong. And you know what? I would see them in the gym later. Cause I would always send them to my guys. Cause they just are great. And they, they work great with, uh, orthopedic faults and older folks. Like I said, um, masters, once you're over 40, you're in the masters category. <laughs> so like people like me, 
they would be in there and I'm like, Hey, how's your shoulder holding up? I hadn't stuck a needle in them yet. And they're like, I feel great. Cause they just needed to move the joint and they needed to get it strong. It's not, this is not rocket science. I have no idea how as human beings, we have moved so far away from just basic animal behaviorism. You don't see when you see an animal injure itself, you can actively watch atrophy happen. And then you can start to, my dog, she tore her ACL and all summer she was holding her leg up like this and her glutes completely atrophied. And then her other glutes started getting more robust because she was compensating. And then her spine started getting funky. I mean, it's like, this is not rocket science. When our dogs are overweight, the vet tells you, if you don't get your dog's weight in check, it's going to be di- It's going to have diabetes. Well, I have no idea why we as humans think that we're any different on this one. We so can't beat nature. We will never win. No. So it's like, if you want to be a human being on this planet and you want to enjoy a quality of like, I personally, my goals, I want good sleep. I want good health, robust health. I want a good libido. I want good joint. I've had my joints and my back and my hip impinge upon or infringe upon my sex life. I don't want that. Right. I want to enjoy intimacy with my husband. I want to, you know, be able to eat carbohydrates when I want and not have it completely sideline me. And the only way for all of those things to happen is to be active and have good muscle mass really. Absolutely. Cause you can't, you know, you get this too. I'm sure I hear it all the time on social media. I'm doing everything. I'm intermittent fasting. I'm following carnivore. I'm following this. I'm, I'm doing all the things I'm taking all the supplements. I just can't lose any weight. And I always ask, are you lifting weights? And they say, no. And I'm like, well, then why, why not start with the lifting weights part? Right. Like that's probably the most critical part. Honestly, you can, you can almost outlift a bad diet almost, but you know, I mean, you, you really do have to dial in your inflammation through your mouth. But at the end of the day, I think that the lifting weights part, I would say would be start there. Right. And it's not about choking down 75 capsules a day and out supplementing a bad diet. You can out train potentially maybe kind of meet in the middle, but you're not going to outwork ultimately a, a really poor diet which brings me to um, a, a question about, you know, um, carbohydrate versus protein and how much protein should people be considering to get a day is enough. Well, I am terrible at getting my protein in. So I am a bad, <laughs> I'm a bad <laughs> poster child for this. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> I try. I just have a hard time eating that much. Um, ideally if you're lifting regularly, you, I would say you want to eat a gram of protein per pound of body weight, which is a lot. And if you're a much bigger human, then, you know, I say at least the upper end is 120, 130 grams, uh, man or woman, you know, so and body composition changes real fast when people get enough protein. I was just yeah. looking in the mirror. I was literally just looking in the mirror when I was changing and I was like looking at my little tummy flub and it's going away. But I was like, this is just a low pro like I'm not getting enough protein, like straight up. I just looked at my, I'm like, I'm not going to have that, that the abdominal area I seek until I, I don't need a six pack, but I'm not going to get rid of this fluff until I get my protein and take up. And so that's pretty critical. I am not uh, opposed to carbohydrates, but I think you have to earn them. And I, I, again, going back to the, if you're not lifting a few times a week, I consider you frail. Same goes with uh, dietary stuff. If you're not lifting weights, I really don't think you get to mow down on the standard American diet without consequence. Right. It's just going to catch up to you. Interestingly, when I had patients come in after a decade in practice, it, it hit me pretty hard. It didn't matter. Like if you were to come to me and say, okay, I have the shoulder condition. How do you think I'll respond with your therapy? your suggested therapies with the injections, uh, whether it be something fancy like stem cells or something simple like prolotherapy. And I would always say the same thing. It depends on your muscle mass and it depends on how you eat truly. But yeah. I would get these guys in there that were drinking Mountain Dew and not eating great. And they still would respond beautifully, but they had great muscle mass. So I think that muscle mass is the deciding factor there. Like yeah. that's the big one. And that's what I'm saying. Like if you are a lift, if you're lifting regularly, you get to enjoy carbohydrates without con- as much concern. Right. We, we still got to dial that in patient by patient, but for the most part, it just changes the whole game. And if you're not lifting and you're mowing down on carbohydrates, you will have a problem at some point. You will find yourself in a pre-diabetic or diabetic state. It's just a matter of when. Absolutely. And especially, you know, working, seeing a lot of cardiovascular patients, they're like, Oh, you know, I, I got, I stopped eating red meat. I stopped eating. I'm like, no, no, don't, no. <laughs> don't stop eating red meat. Don't go vegan. Don't go vegetarian. There are right ways to do those things, but most of them, they're not doing it correctly. And then it ends up as so carb heavy 
Um, and then it really shifts the blood sugar in the wrong direction. It shifts so many things in the wrong direction that really, if you can just consider high quality protein sourcing, you don't have to stay away from protein ever. And I would highly suggest that you don't stay away from protein. Yeah. If it's not a, if it's not a ruminant animal, I won't eat it at this point. I, I, I just, for me, it comes down to the simple fact that I have like so many Americans chronic gut issues mm -hmm. and I've tried all the supplementing around it, through it, healing it, whatever. Bottom line is, is if you have gastrointestinal issues of any sort, extracting nutrients out of plants is hard. It's hard. It just is. And so for me, I am taking the easy, I've decided to hit the easy button. I can extract my nutrients really beautifully out of red meat and fruit. Yeah. And I, I feel great. My skin looks great. My pain goes down. My gut improves. The bloating goes away. The sleep improves. It's just, it, I'm not saying it's for everyone. I'm not saying to, 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 you know, what degree, like I was just talking to a friend who went hardcore carnivore for a month and he looks a little depleted. I'm like, dude, have some fruit and honey, right. you know, <laughs> but I would not tell the average American to have some fruit and honey. In fact, I take most patients off of fruit in the beginning because they tend to overconsume it. Yeah. And fructose can be a real issue. So without getting into a bunch of dietary stuff, and I don't, I mean, I certainly don't want to sway your uh, clients in any way, shape or form or your listeners. I just figure out ways that you can get, you can eat foods that the nutrients are easily extracted from. And I find that protein, especially red meat, tend, grass fed, good quality red meat tends to right. be just kind of a no brainer on that one. Exactly. Yeah. I completely agree. And, you know, it's hard to source like every single meal, especially at the upwards of, you know, 130 grams of protein a day. It's hard to source that, you know, just from grass fed red meat. So I do, you know, we do suggest in our office occasionally to use like some grass fed whey and some other things that can really help fill in the gap because getting enough quality source protein is really the ultimate goal. And so it's so it's so much better than, you know, it's, I think of that as kind of a health convenience food. So like mm -hmm. a grass fed whey protein. Yeah, um, for sure. Yes. And ultimately I, like anti-inflammatory. Yeah. I, I, I do use my grass fed whey protein every day. So I am, <laughs> I'm a big fan. Good, good. Um, so another topic I wanted to get into with you, cause I know that you're a big fan of using sauna and especially how, I mean, there's so many endless benefits of sauna. Um, so I kind of wanted to just have you kind of go over that topic just in general, and then also kind of particularly on the cardiovascular system as well. Yeah. So we could think about it as a scientist and I get these questions all the time. How hot do I go? How long do I go? You know, blah, blah, blah. Do I use far infrared? Do I use this? Do I use that? And I am such an old school naturopathic doctor. I just did a whole write up on this that I'm going to turn into either a post or a blog or a podcast episode on my podcast. But to me, it's just old school hydrotherapy because I'm trying to pump blood, <laughs> just exactly. trying to move, the move the blood, move the lymph. I think of sauna as exercise when you can't exercise. So I used it a lot through having COVID. I used it a lot to, I, I, I cannot tell you the amount of times that because I've had health challenges and sometimes I fall apart, even when I, with my best intentions, things start to fall apart. Mm -hmm. And last year I had a pretty big, uh, gut flare. I don't know exactly what it was due to. I didn't, I didn't want to know because I knew the way out was still going to be the way out. And sauna again, came to my aid in a way that I can't even explain it. It moves things when you can't move as well. And so that's number one. And we are vasodilating and we are vasoconstricting and we are vasodilating and we are vasoconstricting. So we're using cold therapy as well. And then people say, plunge into a bucket of ice. And I'm like, no, <laughs> that is so, it's awful. It's so hardcore. And then they say, how long in the bucket of ice at what temperature humans are so flipping weird, like where did common sense go in my head? I'm like, Here's how I sauna. I sauna, I, I, and then this is how I tell patients, five minutes at whatever temperature you can handle. And then you add a few minutes and then you get to 10 minutes at that same temperature. And then if this is just like strength training, you, when you can safely and effectively lift a weight with control for multiple reps, then you bump up your weight and then you bump up your heat. Right. And so eventually there's some days I can go in there and I can, I'll do like 120 degrees 
at for 45 minutes, that's a different technique than hitting 150 for 10 minutes. Right. It's a totally different impact on my physiology and I'm doing it for different reasons. And so I don't want to, there is no right way. I think the beautiful thing about sauna and cold water hydrotherapy is that it is the most individualized medicine and it meets the patient where they're at. Absolutely. And so I use it that way. And then I'll go outside. I may jump in the, the, tub outside and it's 35 degrees here in Oregon, or I may just stand beside it and then put my arms in and a leg in, or I may just rinse it on my arms and legs just to get the blood back to my core. So it's just hydrotherapy people like this doesn't have to be crazy. The other thing is hormesis. If you want to get a little more sciencey hormesis is the idea that you stress a system and then you rest a system and it's in the rest that you get the gains and you get the healing and you get all the vitality. And so that's the same reason I lift weights. It's the same reason I strength train is to hit my central nervous system, hit my muscular system, and then rest it and feed, refeed it. And that's where I get the beautiful gains from that application. And I think heat therapy, cold therapy, same thing. And then lastly, heat shock proteins, which are amazing for so yeah. many things and BDNF. So, I mean, there's so many good reasons to sauna. Again, I would put that in the non-negotiable category if possible. There are different saunas at different price points that you can access, but the, or at the end of the day, just get hot, right? If you can get yourself sweaty in a hot room or you can take a hot bath and really ramp up the temperature and start sweating, you also are getting some of those benefits. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just old school naturopathic medicine. I mean, you can like I said, as long as you're getting hot, um, and then, you know, we were always taught to finish cold. So if that's okay, I was really hot. So I'm going to take a shower. I'm going to finish that shower cold. Or, um, I mean, here we've got scolding hot summer. So you just walk outside, <laughs> just, <laughs> just lean against the wall for five minutes and cook like a lizard. <laughs> yeah, I had a patient who was just, uh, I think it was just too great. She's like, after I drop my uh, kids off, I turn off my car for a little bit and I sit outside and just swelter in the car. <laughs> like, there you go. Make sure it's on it. Yeah. yeah um, and then, you know, in the, in the winters, our pools get cold. So then you just do a little cold plunge in the pool. So you can make it out of, I mean, so many options, but I like that you say moving when you can't, because it's, you get your heart rate up. You're still getting all the benefits of the lymphatic movement, the blood flow, the endo, endothelial improvement. So the endothelial, I'm sure you've heard us talk about this before the listeners inside lining of the blood vessels just so critical in increasing nitric oxide. So blood pressure regulation, um, preventing plaque deposits, so on and so forth, but you get so much endothelial benefit from sauna that it's like I said, just really becomes a foundational piece of cardiovascular care. Yeah. My husband has high blood pressure, which I've corrected through the two years he's been with me. I mean, we didn't do much I, he just kind of came around to my way yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it went away. <laughs> yeah. It's a foundational thing, but he was so convinced that it was a lifetime sentence. And because it's in the family, pretty hardcore, pretty hardcore cardiovascular stuff. And I was like, dude, I love you. And I'd like to keep you here. So I got a sauna and I used it. I made myself a commitment of 30 days of sauna just to see what would happen. The results were phenomenal. Oh like I lost a ton of weight. I mean, it wasn't weight. It was puff. I just had that like middle-aged hypothyroid, just, I could not get on top of it puff and didn't matter. Like applying hormones, applying therapies and pills wasn't working. Something needed to be sort of like a, a flip needed to be switched, if mm -hmm. you will. And sauna for 30 days did that. He didn't go in there once during the 30 days. And finally I was like, dude, this is going to give you at least 10, 20 years to, on your heart, at least, and much better quality of life. And really how I convinced him was, I was like, if your heart, if your vest, if your vessels are screwed up, your penis is going to be screwed up. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> If your if your vessels are messed up, you're gonna end up with erectile dysfunction. Yes. Like, that is how we just right. That if a if a patient male patient comes in and has erectile dysfunction, regardless of the age, I'm like something is wrong with your cardiovascular system. Yes. Just like if they're really young, something else is going on. But if they're kind of my age, it's like right, we got to work on your cardiovascular system. So that was what got him in there, and just the impact of sweating has been phenomenal. It's wow. his blood pressure just whoom right down into a nice normal range and yep. it's easy, doesn't take a lot of effort. Everybody loves it. Sweating feels great. You feel like a super human when you come out and. Oh, absolutely. Especially then you just kind of like do a cold rinse and then you really do feel superhuman. So alert. Yeah. 
And I will say on that note of endothelium, I think it's again, non-negotiable because whether you end up getting COVID, which everybody will, because Omicron is going to impact everybody and the sorry, but the yeah. therapeutic for that has been shown now it's not working. Mm-hmm. Um, or you choose to get vaccinated either way, your body's going to get flooded with spike proteins and spike proteins damage the endothelium. It's a known fact. So why not get your heart ready in every Absolutely. way you can? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's why we see so much of this myocarditis and the palpitations and everything that's kind of now presenting after be it, you know, infection, vaccination, what have you. Um, but you, you can, kind of prep yourself for this. And that's what we've been saying the whole time, you know, in naturopathic medicine, (laughs) preparation is the best cure. So you just got to be ready. We know that it's coming. We know who it hits preferentially. I mean, it is preferentially selecting for a group of people and we know or for poorest outcomes. So yeah, right. it's, it's kind of like, get ready, get resilient, get your ducks in a line. And it's not, and, and to anybody who's, who's on the fence, I will say this, and this is the tough love. It's not negotiable. Like, do you want to live or not? Because if it's not this, it's going to be something else. So all of the things that you and I are talking about, Lauren, are like, 101 how to not right. die of anything exactly <laughs> ever because I want a healthy happy life I don't want to be crippled in a chair or in a walker or spending 20 30 years being maintained by allopathic medicine in a subhuman state you know I just that's not the future I want no kidding because I mean age it sounds so cliche but age is truly just a number you can be 75 or 80 and feel excellent and be lapping other 50 year olds that have not had this thought go through their head at any point in time. Yeah. I literally had that happen. I did a, when I was in chiropractic college, I did a, like a little sprint uh, triathlon and uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I was totally out of shape. It was terrible. I sprained my ankle and I fell in a hole and sprained my ankle before I jumped in the water did the swim, did the cycling. It was terrible. And then we got to the run and I'm like, well, at least I can hobble along and and do this. And there's this little old man and he is doing this consistent shuffle like this. He looked like he'd been doing the shuffle for like decades. I mean, he, this is how he'd been running and I get up to him and I pass him and I'm like feeling pretty good. And then all of a sudden he just laps me. I can't even he just laps me. And I learned the lesson that day. Like that is consistency. Oh yeah. He pays off. He beat yeah. me and he will always continue to beat people until he drops dead, but he will do it mobile and he yes. will do it with, <laughs> you know, consistency and tenacity. Oh yeah. And that's a consistent, persistent application of the things that, you know, are foundational and non-negotiable. Yeah. And that's how you get there. I know same thing. I'll, I don't know if you've hiked camel back out here, but it's kind of a beast. I've tried. I didn't get all the way up. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if you have, you know, that's kind of been my fallback during the winter. I always am hiking camel back and there are people that stay doing that all year round. And it's a lot of them are these like older guys or older women, and they will just go blow up that mountain right past me. And that's absolutely humbling. And I <laughs> good on them. I, oh, yes. I applaud them as yeah. I hope to be that lady someday. Me too. I'm working on it day <laughs> in and day out. Well, this has been so, so fun. Um, Before we get to where our listeners can find more about you and all about your challenges, which I absolutely love. She does a don't be zombie bait challenge, which I just absolutely love. Um, Love the name of it, everything. Um, But first question is, how do you, Dr. Tina, live a heart healthy lifestyle? That is a good question. I, so I specialized in musculoskeletal medicine and pain. Right. And so in my head, treating musculoskeletal medicine and pain requires X, Y, and Z. It turns out that's the same X, Y, and Z to treat cardiovascular disease. And it's the same X, Y, and Z to treat neurodegenerative or any kind of neurological disease. It basically comes down to keeping inflammation low and having a healthy immune system that cooperates with you and doesn't turn on you or leave you high and dry when needed so that you don't succumb to chronic infections and at the end and, and movement, like we just talked about so much and strength training. And so I, that's how I look at it is I'm just doing all the things for all the things. (laughs) (laughs) That is how I live a, a healthy cardiovascular life because my cardiovascular system is just part of the rest of this and I need all of it to be working. And so good sleep, really prioritizing sleep, 
it's, that's not negotiable. I won't, if someone messes with my sleep, they got to go. They're out of my life. (laughs) Um, really making time for myself in the morning has been a huge, like, I just won't do anything. I did, I did this 9am interview with you because I love you, but Mm -hmm. I won't do a 9am interview for anybody else because I don't do anything before 10am. I won't, I literally will not start working until 10am because I just am not done yet. I got a sauna. I got to get my exercise or my quiet time in, drink my coffee, have my relaxing morning has made such a difference in just my blood pressure and how my heart feels, to be honest with you. And then really honoring the way that I move and eat, because that is a sign of respect for your body. And if you don't move much and you don't eat well, I really do think that that is a reflection of how much you respect yourself. So, uh, that's made all the difference for me. Cause I used to have this weird, uh, I didn't have high blood pressure, but bilaterally things were very different. And that lower blood pressure number, like was starting to come up. And so for me, it was like, okay, this is a sign that I got to do something. So just taking time for myself and doing all the things in a way that is really honoring my body. I don't look at it as work or tasks that I have to tick off. It's just like, this is what I get to do to have this meat suit really honor the spiritual being inside of me. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. We have an incredible machine here and we have to treat it with respect. Well, awesome. So tell our listeners where they can follow you, find more about you, read your blogs, all the things. Yes. Well, I have a podcast that I would love for you to come on and talk about heart health. It is called the doctor, the Dr. Tina show. You can find it on any podcast player. I'd love if people would go check that out and subscribe if they like it. Uh, you can find me on Instagram is probably my most active place because most of these platforms are tyrannical and crazy. So, uh, Instagram's no exclusion, but <laughs> that's where I, that's where I've learned how to play the best. So it's at Dr. Tina, D R T Y N a. And then from there, you can find in my link in my bio, you can find all the things, my don't be zombie bait challenge. You can get on my email list and follow me there. I write really great. I like, I, I, I do. I'll give myself a pat on the back. I try to write really great comprehensive emails that bring a lot of value to people's lives. So that's it for now. Awesome. Well, you heard it here, guys, all encompassing health things, really foundational. Give my friend, Dr. Tina, a follow. And we so appreciate you being here today. Thank you so, so much for your time. Yes. Thanks for having me. It was so fun. That does it for today's episode. Thanks so much for listening to the Healthy Heart Show. Please help us get the word out by liking and subscribing to our podcast and our Facebook page, Natural Heart Doctor. Please show support for our podcast sponsor, Cardiology Coffee, your resource for organic, antioxidant-rich, mold and pesticide-free coffee shipped straight to your door. Learn more by adding at Cardiology Coffee on Instagram and visiting cardiologycoffee.com. This podcast provides materials for information and educational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice. We encourage you to contact your physician for any of the health issues discussed here.